Uh, we're going to talk next to, uh, looks like it's going to be Sean from San Antonio, Texas. <clears throat> Hi, Sean. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Uh, my question is about Titus 3.10 today, which says reject a divisive person after first and second warning. Um, reject a person who stirs up division, causes division. The King James says changes it to, well, the Greek word is hereticos, a hereticos person. Um, yeah. And, you know, we also have that word heresies, the noun used in a few places, the sect of the Sadducees, the sect of the Pharisees, etc. Um, I'm right. wondering if you kind of have some idea about the evolution of that term, heresies or hereticos, from meaning sectarian or divisive to kind of the current meaning, which is kind of a, a really bad idea, is kind of the meaning currently. Um, do you, have you studied that at all or looked into how that kind of happened? Uh, yeah, I've actually, I did study that word in the past, and I, I know that it's, Great. it is used differently, differently today than it was back then. What I don't know is how the etymology developed from, from what it was then to what it is today. Here's what I, here's how I've always assumed it be so, and I think that church history could possibly bear this out. That in the early church, of course, there's one standard doctrine taught by the apostles everywhere. And if a person in the church or a, a teacher uh, alongside the church who was not really part of it began to teach a doctrine contrary to that, he was dividing the body of Christ because the body of Christ was, you know, united in the apostles' teaching. Now, the early church had their divisions about some things. I mean, they had their personal issues with each other. But when it came to official doctrines taught in the church, they had to stick with what the apostles said. The closest thing to divisions that we begin to see developing in Corinth is when some are saying, I'm of Paul, and some are saying, I'm of Apollos, and some are saying, I'm of Cephas. That doesn't mean that those men were teaching different doctrines from each other, but they had different ministry styles or different claims to, uh, to the respect of, of the, uh, the people who were saying those things. I don't think they're saying, we're going we're gonna to follow what Apollos teaches instead of what Paul teaches. It's rather, you know, we, we're more impressed with Apollos than with Paul, kind of a thing. Uh, so I think that in the early church, you really didn't find any church's leadership teaching things different than the apostles taught. Now, therefore, if somebody taught something sectarian, something separate, uh, different from what the apostles taught, that was a false doctrine. It also divided them from the rest of the church because there was no reason for anyone to follow any doctrines other than the apostles taught because the apostles actually were around to confirm what they taught. Now, what's happened throughout history after the apostles were gone, different church leaders began to interpret what the apostles said differently from each other on some subjects. Uh, these subjects, generally speaking, were not subjects that define whether you're a Christian or not, but they were subjects that, uh, you know, are separate subjects that Christians saw differently than other Christians, and the apostles weren't there to clarify. Now, the, the difference between somebody who teach something wrong in that situation and one who did so when the apostles were alive is that the person who taught an, a non-apostolic doctrine when the apostles were alive, they could be corrected by appeal to the apostles who were around, who could clear that up. Whereas after the apostles were gone, it wasn't so easy. I mean, uh, some things Paul said, even Peter said this in Second Peter chapter 3, around verse 15 or so, 15, 16, I think it is, Second Peter 3, Peter said some of the things that Paul wrote are hard to understand. And he said some people who are unlearned and unstable, twist them to their own advantage <clears throat> as they do the other scriptures. Now, this was, un, this was unforgivable in a sense while the apostles were still alive. After all, Peter was still alive. He was writing the letter. And there's no, there was no value uh, in claiming, well, the, the apostles were unclear about this when you could actually consult the apostles and ask them. But after the apostles were dead, one might very sincerely be intending to teach true doctrine but be mistaken, because uh, they're interpreting something the apostles said wrongly, and the apostles are not there to say, no, uh, this is what I meant. And this, of course, meant that when the apostles were alive, no one could, in good conscience, in the church, teach something contrary to what the apostles taught. But after the apostles were gone, people in good conscience could think they're teaching what the apostles taught on some subject, and be mistaken, and someone else could hold a different view of what they thought. Now, that developed into a situation where I feel having the wrong opinion about something did not have to divide. When the apostles were alive, 
when Paul wrote and so forth, those who taught something contrary to apostolic doctrine were dividing the church. But, but the, the unity of the church is not based on full agreement on every point, uh, essentially. Although the church could have full agreement on every point in the first century when the, the apostles could correct things. But the unity of the church is built on having the Holy Spirit, having the life of Christ, and being followers of Christ. And our opinions about certain esoteric matters, which the apostles might have clarified when they're here, but they're not, uh, those things, I don't, think, I don't think they have to be divisive. In other words, Paul, even in his lifetime, knew that some Christians, probably those of Jewish background, wanted to keep a holy day and wanted to restrict their diet. He talks about this in Romans 14, verses 1 through 7. And other people in the church didn't feel those convictions. And Paul just said, well, just do it. Follow your own convictions. You know, let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind. Even then, there were things that Paul said, you know, some of you have the same opinion I do, some don't. But he didn't say what his opinion was there. All he said is, there's liberty in these kinds of things. You know, it's not sinful to keep a day or not to keep a day. It's not sinful to eat foods of any kind or not to eat them. So just let everyone follow his own conscience. And... So even when the apostles were there, I mean, Paul could have written to the Romans and said, now the guys who are not keeping every day alike, they're the ones I agree with. Or the ones who eat all things, they're the ones I agree with. But he didn't. He just, he just kind of shepherded the church to, to tolerate differences of opinion on things that don't matter that much to what one's holiness or one's following Christ. And when the apostles were gone, they should have kept that same attitude. What happened in the next 300 years, or 200 after the apostles were dead, is lots of you know, different doctrines about esoteric things that are not clear in Scripture began to be taught differently by different teachers. And that bothered some people. And they thought, no, we should be all teaching the very same thing. But the question then is, well, whose thing are we supposed to be all teaching? And that's when they began to have ecumenical councils, where the bishops would get together and argue and debate and vote and whatever, and decide what all Christians have to believe on this subject or that subject. Now, the truth is that the subjects that they decided at these councils almost never had anything to do with things you have to believe to be saved, but they, things that they had to get people together on if they wanted the church to all talk the same way and, and have no differences of opinion. In my opinion, I think this was an attitude that Jesus and the apostles did not encourage. But the church developed, and it's a very natural, I think, carnal thing to do for leaders to say, I want everyone to agree with me, so let's find out if, you know, if we can make them do that. We'll make a creed, and they have to obey this creed. They have to agree to this creed. Um, but I think Jesus, remember when the disciples said, Lord, we saw some people casting out demons in your name, and they don't walk with us, so we told them not to do it. Jesus, he said, don't forbid them. If they're casting out demons in my name, they're not going to speak evil of us. Whoever's not against us is for us. Jesus gave a lot of liberty. As long as people were essentially, you know, sympathetic toward him and, and seeking to do the right thing before God, Jesus wasn't particular about every kind of uh, doctrinal point or uh, agreement about every point, and Paul wasn't either. And in my opinion, what has happened is we have used the word heresy, which used to mean division, and because holding a wrong doctrine did cause division, against the apostles, when the apostles were there and someone was teaching something contrary to them. It was like they were adversaries of the apostles. But today we've got 40,000 denominations, and each of them think that they're teaching what the apostles taught. None of them are consciously saying, I know the apostles said this, so I'm going to say this other thing. But they're not trying to be divisive, they're just trying to be honest, and some people are mistaken. And honest mistakes are not necessarily divisive, they don't have to be. But denominations often make them divisive. That is, let's just say that somebody holds a, a Calvinist view of predestination and someone holds a non-Calvinist view of predestination. Now, obviously, Paul held one or the other of those two, but he's not here to tell us which ones. And the things he said on the subject were few and far between. And when he did say them, they could possibly be interpreted either way, which means that a person could teach against a Calvinistic view of uh, predestination or for it, and be equally sincere in thinking they're teaching what the apostles taught. They're not being divisive. And if you in a church where, let's just say, some people do take the Calvinist view, and some people don't, instead of dividing into two denominations, which is an abomination, I think, uh, Paul seemed to think it was in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 
those people should say, well, we all love Jesus, don't we? Yeah, if you're following Jesus, I'm following Jesus. That's good. You can, you can believe this about predestination. I'll believe this other thing. Who cares? That it's not a, you don't go to heaven or hell because you believe a certain thing about predestination. It's, it's an esoteric question. I'm not saying that, that it can't be known or that it, it isn't good to know as much as you can about these kind of things, but there are things that are first tier in importance. And there are things that are second tier in importance. And almost everything is second tier. What's on the first tier, where everyone must believe, is that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He you know, died for our sins. He rose from the dead. He's ascended to heaven. He's the king. And we have to obey him. I mean, those are the things that are first tier issues. And many, many other theological questions were discussed at uh, councils. And then they decided on one or another view, and then they made everyone who didn't agree on the majority view a heretic. And they called a person a heretic if they didn't hold what the latest council agreed on. In my opinion, most of the things the councils talk about, God couldn't care less what people think about them. Because they are non-issues when it comes to following Jesus. And we have, uh, the church has made mountains out of molehills here and uh, you know, sought to artificially create uh, an agreement in beliefs among all Christians by these creeds, and yet Jesus didn't give us any such creeds. The apostles didn't give us those creeds. They may be true. I'm not, I'm not against the, the things that the creeds affirm. They may be telling the truth. What I'm against is saying everyone who doesn't follow this particular creed is now no longer orthodox. He's now a heretic. And that's how the word heresy began to develop. It, it used to be, if you taught something different than the truth, you were deliberately dividing the body of Christ because you're opposing the apostles. Now, you can teach something that you think is true, and you might be mistaken, but you're not doing it to divide the body. And it doesn't have to divide the body. The body can stay united with these differences of opinions. It hasn't because of the carnality of Christians. People have a hard time fellowshipping with someone that doesn't agree with them on something, and so they start their own group. But that's wrong. We're supposed to be able to fellowship with people who don't agree with us on issues that don't, don't matter. So, uh, so I think the word heresy now simply means someone who doesn't believe what I believe. And you know, whoever, whoever the person speaking is. If someone says, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, replacement theology, that's a heresy. Well, that's an opinion of the dispensationalists. It's not the opinion of the rest of the church. Uh, only the dispensationalists really hold that view. Um, you know, uh, if someone says, well, uh, to believe in human free will, that's a heresy. Well, that's if the person speaking is a Calvinist then to them they see it as a heresy. The rest of the church doesn't. That is to say, there's not, on some of these peripheral issues, there's simply not one view that all Christians have to hold, and that everyone who teaches something else is a divisive heretic. And I, it, you could say it would be different if the apostles were here today to tell us which person is right and which was wrong. But since that isn't the case, we have to allow a certain liberty about things. We have to decide, first of all, is this question that, that's being debated, is that really a very important question for everyone to agree about? It might not be. And secondly, uh, does someone who doesn't agree with it, are they trying to divide the church? Trying to, are, they, are they denying the Bible? Are they trying to oppose apostolic teaching? Or do they think that they're teaching apostolic teaching? I mean, these are, these are the questions uh, that we, we have to wrestle with and still maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, according to first, uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 4.3. Anyway, so I can't I can't tell you like a like a Oxford dictionary would how the heres the meaning of heresy evolved through time, but I see a major shift from uh, heresy meaning a divisive person, which meant anyone who opposed the apostolic teaching while the apostles were alive to keep it clear on the one hand, and now it just means anyone who disagrees with me because I think that I believe everything the apostle did, and whoever doesn't agree is now a divisive person. We can avoid that by simply saying, if a person loves Jesus and believes in Jesus, as I do, then any other number of things they teach that doesn't spoil their following Jesus adequately uh, is negotiable, and they don't have to agree with me, and I don't have to call them a heretic, because I think their view is wrong. Agree. Thank you. Uh, I, maybe your next book can be called Heresy, It's Not What You Think. <laughs> Um, like uh, well, uh, thank you. I don't know what my next book will be. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Good talking to you. Thanks for joining us.